We come before you on this holy day and Lord, we really desire that you do something special within our lives. We know that the words of a man is futile and useless unless it echoes the words of God. And so Father, I plead that even as we open up your word, we are pleading not to hear the words of a man, but we want to hear your words. For we know, Father, that that same word which called this world into existence, that same creative power is found in the written word. And I plead with you, Lord, please, we beg of you. We believe that human probation is soon to close. And we are told in inspiration, unless a radical change takes place within our lives, we will be found wanting. And Father, we are truly thankful that there is a remedy, that there's hope for every one of us, and that hope is found in our loving Savior. Please bless us, Father, and abide with us. Please may the third person of the Godhead be present to impress these truths upon our hearts. We love you, Father, and we ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Blessed Sabbath. Yeah, it's good to see some faces we have not seen for some time. Um, we're going to do, by God's grace, yeah, by God's grace, we're going to do a very short study. <laughs> by God's grace. Um, what we're going to be looking at, yeah, the Lord had impressed my mind on the subject some time back to look at the subject, but back home we never ever got a, got a chance to study it due to other impressions God had been making. So that today I thought maybe it's best that we, we look at these things. Now what I'm going to say, what we're going to do, we're going to specifically look at Revelations chapter 18, the fall of Babylon, that final announcement that Babylon has fallen. But I truly believe that it's very much possible to have exited outside of Babylon. It's very much possible, I'm saying physically, to have left physically, we have left the location of Babylon. When I say the location of Babylon, I'm talking about the fallen denominational churches. It's very much possible to have left the fallen churches and still be a Babylonian. Very much possible. And based upon what we're going to look at, God says, based on the Bible, do you know that you can physically question that God physically take the, the Israelites out of Egypt, that he physically take them out. Very much he done so. But you know that even though he physically took them out, you know that Egypt was still in their hearts. Very much still in their hearts. Now we're going to study publicly and see that God specifically mentions, specifically the Bible mentions they are gods of Babylon. You hear what I'm saying? They are gods of Babylon. And I believe that if we cherish any one of these gods, we're not going to study all the gods of Babylon. We're going to only look at three gods of Babylon, just three of them. And I believe that if these gods, which God calls idols, if these gods of Babylon are within our hearts, when Babylon falls, we will fall with Babylon. And I believe that Babylon is about to fall. Very much it's about to fall. Very, very close. I believe we're on, we on the borders of it. Now, friends, before we fully get into our study, I'm coming back to this, but do you know what took place a couple of days back? What date is this? I don't know if you, my eyes are not too good. What date is this? The first. first of June. Couple of days back. Do you know what took place in South Africa? Couple of days back. It says, yeah, BRICS ministers. Now, it says BRICS ministers. Now, I don't know if you can see these two people sitting here. This is Sergio Lavrov, the minister of where? <laughs> Russia, F Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, and this is South Africa's Minister of Foreign Affairs. Now, lady, that's her name. Thank you, sister. It says BRICS ministers meet in push to establish a group as a counterweight to the West. Now, the West, the West what is it referring to the West? The United States and its allies. Now, come with me in your Bible. Come with me in your Bible. Actually, you know what? Ish, why did I start here? But it's fine. Before I go anywhere, let's finish the article. Let's finish it. It says here, yeah, now where's this meeting taking place? Cape Town. Do you know what takes place? 
a few months later in Johannesburg. A few months later in Johannesburg, I believe two more. Sorry? The, the summit itself. Not, it's not going to be the ministers of foreign affairs. No, no, no. You're going to see the leaders. Now, do you know that the ICC issued an arrest warrant for Putin? And do you know that because South Africa said we cannot arrest him? Do you know that America has been agitating trouble for South Africa? Now, if we had time, friends, maybe in the afternoon, we won't record, but we'll show some things that show you what America's trying to do. It's too lengthy for us to add in the study. Can't, can't do it. But I want us to, to look at this. Now, I'm, I'm not supposed to start here, but it's fine. It says here, yeah, it says Cape Town, June 1st. It says foreign ministers from BRICS. Now, someone, I know that many of us might not be aware of what's BRICS. Now, BRICS is an acronym. If you look at BRICS, it's an acronym. B, Brazil, or uh, Russia, I, India, C, China, and S for who? South Africa. Now, it's very, very interesting. Friends, I'm telling you, this meeting is prophetic. <laughs> I am telling you, God made something crystal clear that where South Africa is standing, we're going to show you. But let us read this. It says, foreign ministers from the BRICS countries are meeting in South Africa from Thursday. Thursday would have been the first, right? As the five-nation bloc seeks to forge itself into a counterweight to the Western geopolitical dominance in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, friends, let me say this. Come with me to Matthew 24. Come with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Now, this is very, very familiar. Matthew the 24th chapter. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus was asked in verse 3 for the signs that will indicate the nearness of his coming. And Jesus said to them, he list a whole lot of signs. But I want to go to the crux of the matter. Now, I want you to see Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. Matthew 24, verse 7. Now, before I read verse 7, verse 9, I believe that many of us know. What is verse 9 referring to when Jesus says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and you shall be killed or hated by all nations for my name's sake. What event is that? The Sunday law. This is the Sunday law. So before we get to the Sunday law, because when the Sunday law comes, our probation for seven day Adventists begins to close. But Jesus gives us events that precede that. I want us to see verse 7. Matthew 24, verse 7. It says, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What, in one word, what will you call that? War. Simply put, it's war. It says, and there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. And then verse 8, Jesus says, all these are not the end. He doesn't say when you see these things, it's the end. He doesn't say it's the end. He says when you see this, it's not the end. What is to come is greater. He says all these are only the beginning of sorrows. Meaning that when we see these things, it's not yet the end. It's the beginning. Now, he says nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's war. But friends, what Jesus mentioned is a pestilence. Pestilence just simply means sickness. What year did the sickness, the pestilence break upon this world? 2020. After 2020, many events started unfolding. When did Russia invade Ukraine? It was last year. Last year. All these events that we are looking at in verse 7, I see them fully being fulfilled in verse, from, from the year 2020 going forward. Now, what I'm going to say that there's war, someone might say to me, brother, there's always been wars. And I'll say that is true. That is very, very true. There's always been wars. But I believe that the Bible specifically identifies the lost war. Just before the, the Sunday Lord specifically identifies the lost war. Now someone says, where in the Bible will I see the lost war? It's specifically found in the book of Daniel. Daniel specifically identifies the final war just before Jesus Christ comes or just before the Sunday law. Now come with me in your Bible to Daniel 11. Daniel chapter 11. I want us to look at the final war that the Bible predicts, Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, verse 40. 
Now, in the book Testimonies to Ministers, 112, there's an interesting statement that Ellen White specifically speaks on Daniel 11. Testimonies to Ministers 112. She says that the light Daniel received was especially given for these last days. When, what Daniel received, what days was it for? The last days. She says the visions he saw on the banks of the Uli and the Hedekel, the great rivers of Shinai, are now in the process of fulfillment and all that is yet to come, she says, will be fulfilled in its order. Now, I want us to look at Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. This vision of Daniel 11 is sold on the banks of the Hedekel. And she says that this is now in the fulfillment. It's now in the process of fulfillment. I want us to look at Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, verse 40 specifically identifies a war between the king of the north and the king of the south. It says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. And at that time, or sorry, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. Now, even though it doesn't mention who is the him, it's the king of the north. And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. That's the king of the north. And the king of the north shall come against him like a wild one, with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. And he shall enter into countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, I'm not going to explain everything that's been said there. I just want us to look at the king of the north and the king of the south. So I'm just going to put it here. Matthew 24, Jesus says there's going to be war. Specifically identifies. But Daniel identifies the lost war, lost war. Because after verses 40, verses 41 says that the king, of the, the king of the north, it says, shall enter into the glorious land. Now, if we had time to study the glorious land, we would see that specifically Protestant America. And it says that many shall be overthrown. Now, if we had time to look at that overthrown, we've studied it many times, you would see that overthrown means when somebody is overthrown, they cannot come back to God. In other words, their probation is closed. But I want us to look at the king of the north and the king of the south very quickly in light of the Spriggs meeting. So inspiration specifically mentioned it's going to be war. Bible, spiritual prophecy. Now, I want us to look at the king of the north and the king of the south. Now, quickly, we have studied this before to some of us. Can you all please tell me very quickly, the king of the north, who is the king of the north? Um, I'm so <laughs> Based upon Daniel 11.40, who would we say, let, who is the king of the north of Daniel 11 verse 40? It is, yes, sister, it's the papacy. It's specifically the papacy, specifically. The king of the south, you don't have to give me a nation. How do I know that the king of the north is the papacy? Look at verse 36. It's speaking of the king of the north. It says, and the king shall do according to his will. It's talking about the king of the north. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. And he shall prosper till his indignation be accomplished. For that, that is determined shall be done. My question is which religious power today exalts themselves above God, claims to be God, and speaks blasphemy against God? None other but the Pope of Rome. It's the papacy. This is the king of the north. Now, who is the king of the south? Now, when I'm saying the king of the south, geo geographically, do you know which nation was the, it was Egypt? Now, I'm not going to read it. You can see it, Daniel 11, verse 7 and 8. The king of the south was Egypt, specifically identifies Egypt. Egypt. Now, I'm not saying today that the king of the south is Egypt, but the principles... What was the principles of Egypt? Remember Exodus 5 verse 2, what did Pharaoh say? Who is Jehovah? I know not Jehovah, neither will I let Israel go. So it's a denial of the existence of Jehovah. What do you call that? Atheism. 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 So when we are looking for the king of the south, we are looking for nations that hold to atheism or communism. Communism ideas. Now, which nation would that be today? Which nations hold to this? Russia and which nation? And well, and China. China. Russia and China. So basically, question, 
If communism and atheism continues to exist, can the papacy, which is a, rel a religious power, can it have dominance over the world? Think of it, would people accept a religious power who are fully atheists to govern and rule them? Can't do it. In order for the papacy to gain dominion, atheism must be swept away. Communism must be swept away. Do you know that biblically speaking, the Bible teaches that's gonna happen? Revelation chapter 13, verse uh, 17, verse 15 and 17, it says that he calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and born, to receive a mark in their right hand on their forehead. Question, how much of the world, all the world, all the world is going to receive the mark of the peace. There will be a remnant. So question, if the world is going to be split up between the remnant, those who receive the seal, and majority receive the mark, is there any atheist there? None. So question, will the papacy gain dominion over the world? But what must be swept out of the way in order? Thank you, sister. Atheism must be swept away. Communism must be swept away. Now, publicly, the final wars between the king of the north and the king of the south. However, the papacy does not have strength to take on Russia and China, don't have the strength. Don't have the strength. My question to you is, publicly speaking, does the Bible identify a nation, publicly speaking, that gives its power unto the beast, the papacy? Which nation? America. Revelation 13 verse 12 says about America, he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and he caused the earth and them that dwell in the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So America is the beast that is going to actually do the job of the papacy. It's going to be the United States of America that's going to do the work of the papacy, regain the power of the papacy within this world. Now friends, I'm not studying. This is just, I'm just speaking now. M much of these things we could have studied. But I want to ask a question. How is America warring against the king of the south today, specifically in the forefront Russia? Is there a war in Ukraine? Yeah. Is Russia at war with Ukraine? But question, who was funding Ukraine? Who was supporting Ukraine? It's a proxy war, sister. Who is, who is doing that? It's the U.S., but be more, but yes, it's the U.S. But I'm saying, yes, it's the U.S., that's 100%. But the U.S. is working through an alliance. What is it? NATO. It's specifically NATO. Specifically NATO. Now, please speak to me. NATO stands for North, North, N-O-R-T-H. NATO, first letter in NATO is North. First letter is what? North. First letter in NATO is North. North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Do you know what was the purpose of NATO? Now God showed me, what I'm about to show you is sweet. The next part, God showed me this is sweet. He showed me this this morning. I'm going to share what God showed. But before we get there, I want you to see this. Now listen to this. Listen to this. I'm coming back to that. I want you to see this. Now tell me, what is the purpose of NATO's existence? That's a core principle laid out in Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. It obliges member states to protect each other in case of a war. It says an armed attack against one ally will be an attack on all allies. Meaning, if one NATO nation is attacked, all NATO nations will retaliate. This allowed NATO members to pool and share their military resources. They built efficient defense capabilities, but there was more to NATO than just defense. It was an alliance of liberal countries, an engine of democratization that was supposed to promote common values and interests, also push back against the rise of communism. What was NATO's purpose to push back against what? The rise of communism. That's the duty of NATO, push back against communism. So which nations would NATO specifically be designed to push back against? Name the nations, Russia and China. Now friends, interesting. Very interesting. I never make up the word NATO. NATO is something that's been in existence before I was even born. And it starts with North. I wonder what's BRICS. I wonder the nations of BRICS. I wonder what they are called. I wonder what the nations of BRICS are called. <laughs> Watch it. She's like, the article, look at the article. Now friends, look at the date. 26 April 2023. 
listen to what the, the, the nations of BRICS are called. It says how BRICS nations are leading the push to free global south from Western's financial system. Speak to me. What are the BRICS called? King of what? South. King of the south. Friends, this is, I'm not, this is, this is the article speaking. BRICS nations. South Africa standing on the side. Publicly, if you want to know where South Africa in Daniel 11, King of the South. King of the South. King of the South. So when we are talking about BRICS, BRICS, we are talking about specifically King of the South. This is what we are talking about. Friends, you think this is an accident? This is no coincidence that they call the Global South BRICS and NATO is called North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the North and the South. I wonder if they're at odds today. BRICS countries, BRICS countries are leading efforts to free again Global South from the financial system of the West. Now, I'm coming, same thing, article says the same thing. Now, what is BRICS challenging? What are they challenging? They're, ch they're challenging the dollar's dominance. Now, China specifically, you know who's that man? Xi Jinping. In his last meeting with Putin, he flew into Russia for the first president, first meeting that a president had with Putin after the invasion of Ukraine. And he said as leaving Putin, just before he jumped in the car, he says we're gonna witness a change that has not been seen. He actually says we're gonna drive a change that has not been seen for the last 100 years. You know what he was talking about? The change of the American dollar's dominance. Now before Russia, or China can firstly take on America, they realize they must first cripple the dollar. That's their goal is to cripple the dollar. Now, it says, look at who also wants to join BRICS. Saudi Arabia in talks to join BRICS Bank. Do you know, I just never have time, I would cut out the clip and show you that right here in South Africa, Saudi Arabia, the Minister of Foreign Affairs was here and he was speaking with the BRICS ox him to come into BRICS. Now friends, you don't know what this means. Do you know what the US dollar was tied to? Uh, tied to, prior to that it was gold. But after World War, they tied it to the, it's called the petrodollar system. It was tied to oil. They made an agreement with Saudi Arabia that oh, we would give you protection. We would give you weapons on just one condition. All you, don't give us money. All you do is sell all petrol, sell it, only accepting the dollar. Mm. Now, do you know if Saudi Arabia joins BRICS, that, that agreement is down. Mm -hmm. The dollar will collapse mm -hmm. instantly. Now, it says again, BRICS bans in talks to admit Saudi Arabia as a member. Now, listen. The world's largest oil producer, Saudi Arabia, is reportedly asking to join BRICS. Now, BRICS is an acronym for the five major emerging global economies, namely Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. International reserve currency planned by Russia and China. Now, the announcement of a reserve currency was made by Russian President Vladimir Putin. The Saudis are cutting oil production as part of OPEC's decision to reduce. Senate Democrats urging President Biden to end cooperation with Saudi Arabia. President Biden vowing to punish Saudi Arabia. Even old friends of the West are ditching it, like Saudi Arabia. And now it wants to be a part of BRICS. Now, friends, you know the Cold War. Does it, have you ever heard of the Cold War? Yeah. Now, the Cold War was between Russia and the United, or the Soviet Union, and the United States of America. Do you know, in that battle for dominance, the commun communism, or Soviet Union, and United States of America were going to be the sole superpower. They were rushing, and there was a battle between them. Not so much physical war, but it was proxy wars. And do you know what happened that caused Russia to fall back, or call, caused the Soviet Union to fall back, and America, America to become the sole superpower? Do you know what happened in history? What caused Russia or the Soviet Union to fall back? The president, at that time, this year was the, he went to, I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, I just forget the president's name. He went to Saudi Arabia, and he told them to actually increase the production 
of oil, increase the production. Now someone says, how would, that, how would have that crippled the Soviet Union? Do you know when there's a lot of something in the market, do you know what happens to the value of that thing? When there's a lot of it, what happens? The price goes down. When it's few on the market, as the price goes what? Up. So what happened was, the president went and spoke to Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia, what they done was, they pumped a lot of oil into the market. Do you know what that happened as Russia being a, 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 a nation that has a lot of oil? You know what happened to its oil price? Because there's so much oil on the market, at price, the, the, the range of that oil, the value of it dropped. That's the way that they crippled the Soviet Union. Do you know what Biden done? A couple of months back, he went to Saudi Arabia and he asked them because he remembered communism. He asked, he asked Saudi Arabia to do what? He, he asked them to increase the production of oil. Do you know what the prince, um, I forget his name, the prince done? Immediately, he decreased the production of oil. <laughs> Immediately, he decreased the production of oil. And Russia was glad with that. Very glad. Now, friends, I want to pause and pray. This is just side note because of what's taking place. This is not our study. It says the UAE, that's the United Arab Emirates. The United Arab Emirates withdraws from the US-led Marine Time Coalition. Now, friends, I want to ask you, the Arabs, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, all these nations, what nations are they? Islamic. Islamic. Now, my question to you is this. In Revelation chapter 11, atheism, the first atheistic nation that the Bible speaks about is found in Revelation 11. Do you know which nation was that? The first, God specifically I men mentions, he says that this nation in Revelation 11 verse 8 comes out of the bottomless pit. Revelation 11 verse 8, the first atheistic nation that would make war open a vowed war against the Bible. Straight after the dark ages, this nation rises up. Friends, we do not know. <laughs> Re Revelation 11, the French Revolution. Revelation 11, specifically of the papal dominance, the Bible specifically speaks in Revelation 11, 7, 8, 9, about a beast that comes out of the bottomless pits and it makes war against the two witnesses, the word of God. That was France. And France, during the French Revolution, denounced the existence of God, atheism. Now, I want you to think of Islam in Revelation 9. Question, where does John see those locusts coming up out of? The bottomless pits. Now, if we had time, we would study this thing, but I can't. Islam comes out of the bottomless pits. France comes out of the bottomless pit. Atheism and Islam come from the same place. So when there's a war between the king of the north and king of the south, which side would Islam be on? King of the north or south? South. Why? Because atheism comes out from the bottomless pit. Revelation 9, Islam comes out of the bottomless pit. Sister? Sorry. Yes. Sorry, yes. We see a lot of coalition between Islam, Judaism, and Romanism. Mm. So if these Islamic countries who have some type of affiliation with the papacy mm. or join the BRICS nation, mm. there's something suspicious yeah. about that because if you are walking with somebody who yes. is in agreement with you, yes. why are you going to the opposing? What, what I'm going to say, what, with, with the Islamic nations, the religious side is siding with the papacy, but the political side is siding with, with bricks. Yeah. Now, I want us to see this. Listen to what, 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 what the prophet says. I want you to see what the prophet says. She says, in India, China, Russia. Is that the BRICS nations? <laughs> These are the BRICS nations. In India, China, and Russia, it's very interesting when I was listening to the, the, the minister of, of, of India speaking, he says that our purpose as BRICS is to bring a new order of things. New order. In other words, that it can't be America and its allies that must dominate the world. We are coming to counterbalance the world. In India, China, and Russia, and the cities of America, so the prophet mentions these nations, 
Now questions, is there an economic war between these nations? Question, did the prophet foresee this? He says their prices would greatly what? Increase, increase. And then she says it will lead to a civil war and then she says there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So inspiration says just before Daniel stands up, we must see a conflict amongst these nations. Now, Daniel 11 specifically she mentions, now listen what's taking place here in South Africa. Foreign ministers of five emerging economies met in South Africa's Cape Town. Top diplomats of the BRICS group of nations reasserted their bloc's ambition to rival Western powers. However, their talks in South Africa were overshadowed by one crucial question. Will the Russian president be arrested if he sets foot in South Africa? Do you think South Africa is going to arrest Putin? No. Not, not possible. Even if South Africa desired to, it's impossible. That's not possible. For a nation to arrest a president can't be. Even if we had that capability, it can't be done. Now, I want you to see, someone says, okay, let us vote for BRICS to win. So that, they can, so that the Sunday law cannot come. Now, friends, based on the Bible, who is going to win? The king of the north or king of the south? King of the north. The papacy is going to gain dominance. America will overcome. Even though it's going to collapse, its dollar is going to collapse. Someone says, what do you mean the dollar is going to collapse? In order to have a digital currency, the nation of America is not going to accept the digital currency unless you can show the nation that the dollar is collapsing. And unless we shift to another system of living, we're all going to die. When Americans see that our only hope out is a digital dollar, they're going to accept it. The whole world is going to go digital, but at first America. Now, I want you to see what it says here. A what order? A new world order. Which nations are pushing this? BRICS nations offer an alternative to the West. So question whether, even if prophecy said nothing, there was going to be a new world order. Either BRICS or Brinnett or the king of the north, but nonetheless is the king of the north. A new world order is coming. A new world order is definitely coming. Now I want to pause and pray. Now, do you know one of the strongest financial nations, I'm saying one of the most strongest economies in, 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 in NATO, do you know which nation it is? Germany. Germany. In NATO, it's Germany. Now, do you know what happened to Germany a couple of days back? It says here, May 25th, Germany falls into a what? A recession as inflation hits the economy again. Germany falls into a recession as consumers in, in, in Europe's biggest economy spend less. So Germany is in a crisis. Germany is in a crisis. Russia and Islamic world, what do they share? Geopolitic vision. In other words, Russia's enemies as Islam's enemies. That's what it's saying. Then Xi, a couple of days back, tells China's security chief to prepare for dangerous storms. So China's preparing, China's preparing. Friends, I want to stop and pray, and I want us to get into our study. What we're going to be looking at, I tell you, friends, a crisis is coming, a new world order. Mm, mm, mm. Again, before we pray, South Africa clarifies diplomatic immunity, stance amid Putin's, amid Putin visits hopes. Now, what do they say? Basically, what is this article simply saying is that they're going to give him an immunity. Meaning that when Putin comes, even though we are part of ICC, Putin's going to be immune. That lock, you have to be locked up, he's not going to be locked up. Now, this has in a, it's, it's causing America to be very angry. Very, very angry. Very angry. Now, I'm going to stop here with Briggs, King of the North, King of the South. And I want us to pause and get into our study. Friends, may God help us as we look at this Babylon. Let us reverently kneel, those who can, and let us go into our study. Loving Father, we, Lord, we just approach your throne with much humility. We are seeking, Father, for your guidance now as we are about to look at the work of preparation to meet the coming crisis. I really plead, Lord, may your word find entrance within our hearts and may you do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. 
I really plead, Father, that you do what my efforts could not do. Impress these things upon our hearts. Help us to see the need to flee from Babylon, not just physically, but even within our hearts. May the idols, may the gods of Babylon find no place within our hearts. Please, Lord, bless us now as we open up your word. We plead, Lord, we really plead that Satan's power within the lives of every one of us would be broken, that we'll get new glimpses of your matchless love and that our hearts will be drawn closer to the one in whom we adore. Please bless us now and abide with us, for we ask these things humbly, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter 18. Revelations, the 18th chapter. We're going to be studying the fall of Babylon. Revelations chapter 18. Now, friends, Revelations, the 18th chapter, we're going to be looking at this. Revelations 18, verse 1 to 4. Now, I want to ask a question. Do you think that Babylon can be healed? No. Cannot be healed. No. Babylon cannot be healed. Publicly speaking, do you know that when you hear a message about Babylon, God doesn't say, reform Babylon. No such message of reform Babylon, no. God's message to Babylon has come out of her. That's the message come out. Babylon cannot be healed. Friends, if, you are, if, if ever we think that Babylon can be healed, and we think we can remain in Babylon, we do so at the peril of our salvation. Babylon cannot be healed. Do you know there's hope for the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Do you know the message to the Seventh-day Adventist Church has not come out? Do you know what's the message to the church? Let Jesus in. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. So Jesus is seeking entrance. Now, friends, someone says, yes, I'm a Laodicean. I'm not a Babylonian. But if you are a Laodicean, which we are, we'll understand that Jesus is not inside our hearts. Jesus is still knocking. Someone says, but I've opened up my heart to Jesus two years ago. Do you know it's very much possible that you could have opened your heart two years ago to Jesus, but do you know it's very much possible, even though he's inside, there's still doors you have shut and Jesus is still knocking in. Do you know that a house doesn't have one door? You know that your house don't have one door. There are many doors to a house and it's true, you could have been converted five years ago, but there are still parts in your life that you have the door shut. Jesus is still seeking entrance. Jesus is still knocking. And he says, if you hear my voice, do you know, friends, every knock is stained with blood. I'm telling you, friends, in order for him to have, in order for him to have even access to knock, his hands had to be nailed to the cross. There's no way he could have had access. Every knock, friends, I'm telling you, is stained with blood. It is stained with blood. Do you know even the time we have has been purchased with blood? It has been purchased with blood. With blood. Now, I want us just to see before we study, before I even start my study, I want us just to see this one point that Babylon cannot be healed. The message is flee. Flee from Babylon. Come in your Bible to uh, Jeremiah 51. I think it's Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. Did I say 51? Mm -hmm. I think let us go to Jeremiah 50. Are we there? Jeremiah chapter 50. I want us to look. Hmm. Verse 6. Hmm. Ha, ah, verse 6. Verse 6. 51, 6. What did I say? What chapter did I say? So I'm so sorry. I'm looking in the wrong place. It's 51, 6. 51, 6. 51, 6. It says, flee. 
out of the midst of Babylon. Now someone might say, why must I flee? We're going to show publicly God says he's going to pour out his plagues or his wrath on Babylon. It says flee out of the midst or flee out of the midst of Babylon. Deliver every man his soul. God says if you want to save your soul, flee out of Babylon. Be not cut off in a iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her recompense. Now I'm not reading 7 and 8. Jump down to verse 9. Watch verse 9. We would have healed Babylon. What did God desire to do for Babylon? Heal it. But she is not healed. What therefore is the conclusion? Forsake her and let us go everyone to his own country. Let's stop there. Question, can Babylon be healed now? Nope. God says Babylon cannot be healed. Come with me in your Bible now to Revelation 18. Revelation chapter 18. Revelation the 18th chapter. Friends, Revelation 18. I know what we're thinking. Hi, Babylon, why should, we, why should we flee? I'm not in Babylon. I'm in the remnant church of Bible prophecy. I'm not in Babylon. True. Very true. But do you know that inspiration says, friends, I want you to think, if prophecy says that a large class of seven day Adventists, great controversy six or eight, are going to abandon their faith, and join the ranks of the opposition. She says, as the storm approaches, they can abandon their faith and join the ranks of the opposition. Question, what were they truly in heart? Even though, because she says, as the storm approaches, a large class who profess faith, not in foolishness, profess faith in the third angel's message. Those of us who knew, understood it, preached it, taught it, believed it. She says that these people who profess faith in the third angel's message, she says abandon their faith and join the ranks of the opposition. Question, if when the Sunday Lord, the storm comes and many Seventh-day Adventists abandon the faith and join the ranks of the opposition, meaning those in Babylon, at heart, what were they truly, even though they were Seventh-day Adventists, Babylonians? Do you know that there, listen to what I'm saying, within the Seventh-day Adventist church, there are more Babylonians than Seventh-day Adventists. Someone says, how dare you say that? The quotation said that. As the storm approaches, a large class who profess faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified by obedience to the truth. Therefore, I'm saying even though physically they were in the remnant church of Bible prophecy, at heart, they are Babylonians. And it's only at a crisis that their character is going to be revealed. And God forbid, friends, that by profession we are Seventh-day Adventists. By profession we have taken the name Seventh-day Adventist, but in heart we are Babylonians. Someone says, I'm not a Babylonian. Well, we're going to study. And if any of these idols or these gods are within your heart, because the Bible God is specifically clear, that why Babylon has fallen, he identifies one thing. We're going to study this in connection with Jeremiah. The literal, Jeremiah prophesied about the literal fall of Babylon. And we're going to combine that with the spiritual fall of Babylon. Question, literally did Babylon fall? The nation, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, did it literally fall and give way to the Medes and the Persians? Yes, it did. But we're going to look at what led to physical, the physical fall of Babylon. Because that's going to be the same thing that leads to the fall of many within Seventh-day Adventists. Why? At heart, they are cherishing the things that are within Babylon. And when Babylon collapses and falls, see now, Babylon's still attractive. I'm saying to many, Babylon's it's a music is attractive. Babylon's diet is attractive. Babylon's clothes is attractive. All that Babylon has is attractive. I'm saying, if the heart is not truly converted, it's attractive. And even if the heart is converted, someone says, what do you mean even if the heart is converted? Do you know that when John saw Babylon in vision, he saw, the, he saw Babylon, the glory of Babylon, do you know that John, the, the great disciple who wrote as if his pen was dubbed, the prophet says, in love, that prophet John, that apostle, when he saw Babylon in its fuller sense, do you know what happened to the man John? Do you know what the Bible says? That he admired. The Bible says that he admired. The, do you know what had to break him out of that? The angel had to rebuke him and wake him up out of that. I want you to come with me to Revelation 17. Friends, what we are about to study, I want you to see publicly, you can be within the remnant church 
but at the heart of Babylonian. Revelation 17. Revelation 17, I want you to see verse 5. Revelation 17, verse 5. It says, and upon the forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. I want to stop there so we're all on the same page. Let's question, what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A church, Jeremiah 6, verse 2, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, that a woman is a church. So when it says that Babylon, the mother of all, it's question, it's talking about a church. Is it a faithful church or an apostate church? Apostate, how do we know that? It says that she's a harlot. Is she faithful to Christ? Nope. She's unfaithful to Christ. This is a harlot. This is an apostate church. Question, it says she's the mother of harlots. Question, does this apostate church have daughters? The mother of what's her children? Harlots. What are children, male or females? Females. Why? They're called what? Harlots. So Babylon is consist of the mother church and the daughter churches. Mother church, the Roman Catholic organization, daughter churches, apostate Protestantism. There's one church that stands distinct from Babylon, and it's the Seventh day Adventist church. Now, I want us to see verse 6, as John saw Babylon. Look at verse 6, as he, verse six, as he saw Babylon, tell me, what does he do which, which, which causes a rebuke from the angel? Look at verse 6. It says, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Friends, you can't tell me, I, I'm converted, I don't, I don't, friends, if the great apostle who's dipped his pen was dipped in love when he wrote, when he saw Babylon in its glory, he says, I admired her. Who are you to say that I'm not pulled to anything Babylon offers me? Friends, don't be deceived. All I'm telling you, you're deceived. If you can sit here and say there's nothing that Babylon has that pulls my heart, I tell you, you're deceived. Look at the next verse, verse 7. The angel had to rebuke him out of that. Verse 7. I wonder if God will send a three, three, three angels to, 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 to break the spell of Babylon over us. <laughs> verse 7. And the angel said unto him, Wherefore didst thou marvel? He had to be rebuked. The angel had to rebuke him. I'm saying the only way that we're going to, we, we, we would cease to be, to be, to be attracted by the beauty of Babylon as those three messages, which is the conclusion as found in the fourth. Now, I want us to study. We are laying a foundation, Revelation 18. Revelation chapter 18. We want to look at Babylon. We want to look at Babylon. So what we're studying is Babylon or the gods of Babylon or the idols of Babylon. But I'm going to suggest that the gods of Babylon, which we're going to study, or the idols of Babylon, can be broken up into three, uh, three sections, or three, 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 three gods. There's more. But I want to deal with the main three. Another time we'll come and show what is, what is God's solution. We're going to study what's his solution to these gods. His general solution, he has a general solution for these three gods, to cure us from the beauty or the attraction of these three gods. God has a remedy to cure us, a general remedy. But another time we'll study each remedy. There is a general remedy. You know, in a medical missionary, you can give someone something general. Maybe they have a problem, their blood is not flowing correctly, their heart's not pumping correctly. You can give them something general, kind pepper, help. But then specifically when I help their heart, what's that hot one? Uh, elder hot one berries. Strength, specifically designed to strengthen the heart. So what I'm saying is now I'm giving you kind pepper as the remedy for these three gods. Another time will be more specific. We give you a hot, hot one, baby. Dealing with each specific god. Now, what I want us to do, what I'm going to suggest, we're going to study now. What I'm going to suggest is this. We want to study what leads to Babylon's fall. Someone says it's the gods. Yes, it's the gods. These three gods 
actually are only a fruit of a root. What leads to Babylon's fall? Yes, these three gods, but if this issue, whatever is here, yeah, what I'm saying is this thing, what we're about to look at, which leads to Babylon's fall, yes, it's manifested in three gods, but it's a root problem. We're going to look at the root problem. And I tell you that this root problem, none is exempt. None is exempt. One of our greatest that we had in this, this, this movement, one of our greatest, he fell away. And the prophet said exactly this very thing, what we're about to study. She used the word, she says that this is it. And she warned him while he was still, he was still not fully gone. He was in the valley of decision and she warned him. She warned him. That man left and he became a Babylonian. Now, Revelations 18, are we there? Are we in Revelations 18? I want us to look at Revelations 18. We're gonna look at verse one to verse four. Revelations 18, verse one to verse four. Now friends, one more point. I want you to look at this quotation carefully before we start. Do you know that we, someone might argue and debate me, no, no such, all what you say, not possible. We seven the Adventists, no way we can be Babylonians. There's no even danger. Look at the quotation. Look at the quotation. Manuscript releases 21, 380. We, now the we is seven day Adventist. We seven day Adventist are in danger of becoming a sister to fallen Babylon. These are not my words of prophets. Question, are we a, is there a danger that we as seven day Adventists can become a sister to fallen Babylon? of allowing our churches to become so corrupted and filled with every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, will we be clear unless we make decided movements to cure the existing evil? So God says that the existing evil that's now within our heart and within the church must be attempts, must be made to cure the church of this existing evil. Friends, before we try and cure, the nominal seven day Adventists, us present truth need to be cured. Amen. First us, then them. Now, I want you to see this before we fully start. Look at this. I was saddened by this. It says, yeah, this year is May 20, what date is that? 27, 2023. It says May 27, 2023, dynamic Pentecostal style, what? Worship. I wonder where this is taking place. It says, with its trance-like meditation, vain repetitions and loud music is hailed by the president of the North American Division as the future of Adventism. So the president of North America of Seventh-day Adventist Church has hailed, May 27, hailed the Pentecostal style of worship as the future worship for the global church. Now, I want you to see their worship. I want you to see their worship. Now, you tell me, now, think if, if I would block, if I took that out of your mind, and what I'm about to show you, Seventh-day Adventists, you tell me what you think this is. I can't. But nonetheless, you get the picture. Now, I want you to see what the prophet says. She says the things you have described 
as taking place in Indiana. Now, friends, please, please, let's stop there. What date was this? What date? May 27, 2023, couple of days back. You saw the worship style, right? Now, listen to what the prophet says. Another sign. She says, the things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me would take place just before what? The close of probation. I wonder what God showed the prophet that would happen within the remnant church just before probation closes. Listen to what she says. Just before probation closes, every uncool thing will be demonstrated. They will be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never reveals himself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. What did the prophet say will happen just before the close of probation? Drums. Drums. Counterfeit worship. Now, I want you to see what the presidents have to say. This is the president of North America of Seventh-day Adventist Church. Listen to what they had to say. Listen. Let the church say amen. Oh, y'all can do better than that. Let the church say amen. If you've been blessed today, let me hear you say hallelujah. If you've really, really been blessed, let me hear you say praise the Lord. You know, my heart is filled. And I must admit, I must confess, Pastor Doggett, I've heard about the worship experience at Patmos. Now I've experienced it, and it is wonderful uplifting spirit filled and let's say amen to the praise team amen everybody to dynamic praise amen everybody and to children's choir amen everybody thank you for your worship experience thank you for lifting your voices and giving praises to our god i would like to extend my congratulations to you in behalf of the 1.2 million members of the North American Division. And uh, Dr. Doggett, thank you for your visionary leadership. Amen, everybody, amen. I travel all over this division and I meet with world leaders. In fact, I met just with 2,000 world leaders just this past Tuesday and Wednesday. And you know what the emphasis is in the world church? Is to have a place like this place. Is to turn our worship centers into community places that will serve the needs of the people that Jesus Christ died for. Do you hear what he said there? That he wants all Seventh-day Adventist churches to be transformed into a worship service like this. Friends, the prophet says this will exactly happen just before probation closes. Someone says, what is the, wrong with this? Friends, there's two kinds of worship. In 1 Kings chapter 18, you see the prophets of Baal jumping, shouting, doing all these things to the sun god. And when Elijah's turn to pray, Elijah doesn't jump, he doesn't shout, he doesn't scream. Elijah humbly kneels and he offers up his prayer to the God of heaven. And fire comes down to testify that this is the correct way of worship. So we don't jump, swing, shout, mm -mm, that's, you sing, swing, celebrate, we don't do that. Humbly we kneel before God. Now, prophet says, if the heart of the work becomes corrupt, she says all parts of the body becomes corrupt. All parts of the body, I'm not reading that, that's volume four. Volume four, 210. Again, May 28, 2023, the North, American Division President joins political leaders to inaugurate the Adventist Church of the Future, complete with basketball training, baseball training, batting, cages, 
a kid, kids gym, gymnasium, gymnastics, volleyball courts, martial arts facilities, and a restaurant. So these are all the programs for the young. Friends, you know what, you know what sports does within the heart? You know what competition does within the heart? Pride, rivalry. Do you know Proverbs says, when your enemy falls, do not rejoice over him. Do not, how can you be playing a game and you beat your enemy? How would you not rejoice? Bible says, do not rejoice when your enemy falls. So how do you rejoice when you're, in a gym, when you're in a boxing ring and you punch someone and they fall? How do you do that? That's why sports cannot be engaged in by Seventh-day Adventist. Cannot be engaged in. Now, I want us to look at Revelation 18. I want us to study, very, it's a short study, the gods of Babylon. Revelation 18. Revelation 18, I'm going to read verse 1. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now, when this angel comes down, how much of the earth is going to be affected by this angel? It says the whole earth was done what? Lightened with the glory of this angel. So this message is God's final message. And how much of the earth is going to hear the message? Entire world. Now, as if you are Seventh-day Adventist, you do not have time to prepare when this angel comes. Because at this time, the angel is working through human instrumentalities to give this message to the world. As a Seventh-day Adventist, when he comes down having great power, you must be in a position to stand. You must have gained victory over the gods of Babylon. You must have gained victory over sin when this angel comes down. Now, verse 2. What's the message of the angel? And he cried mightily, with a strong voice saying, what's the burden of the final message of God to the world? Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitations of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Question, is God's last message an announcement that Babylon has fallen? So when we are studying Babylon has fallen and the gods of Babylon, we are not making up a message. We are studying God's final message to the world. The message that lightens the whole world. God says Babylon's fallen. That's his final message. Announce to the world that Babylon has now fallen. Friends, you know that you can't convince a man sometimes to leave something unless you show him that things about to collapse. In order for, sometimes it has to take that building to catch a fire, to catch, some flame must burn that building for you to realize one must go out. And only, and do you know, do you know literally 9-11, do you know there were people, the first plane, boom, hit. Do you know there were people that still stayed in the building? They did not move, they stayed sitting still, never, they never, do you know who moved? It was the people, they call them blue collar workers. Those people fled out. Why? They knew they have nothing of value inside that building. Blue collar worker was that man that sweeps. That man that cleans and ties. He immediately, boom, that man was gone. <laughs> he was out. But I'm saying those who own possessions inside those, those huge buildings, I tell you, first plane hit, they still kept sitting. Many of them kept sitting. Friends, let me tell you, the pandemic 2020, it was the first plane hit in the building. Some of us are still sitting. God says, advance, we are sitting. Next plane comes. It's not a pandemic. It's the crisis itself. It's the crisis itself. Now, I want us to see Revelation 18. We read verse 2. Babylon has fallen as the final message. Now, I want us to see verse 3 and then verse 4. And then we get into the study. Verse 3 says, Babylon has fallen, verse 2. Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. Now my question is this. God says that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. 
Because it has fallen, what is the conclusion of the matter in verse 4? What does he say? And I heard another voice from heaven saying to his people, Come out of her, my people, that he be not partakers of her. Question. What does Babylon, what, what is Babylon cherishing inside of, what's, what's, what, what, is, what is inside of Babylon based on that verse? There's God's people, but what, God's people are there, but there's something with God's people, sins. So Babylon, yes, it's fallen, and we're going to see, so it's linked to these gods. But inside Babylon, there's two things, it's God's people and sins. And God says, my people, no, no, time's up. Come out, separate yourself. What must they separate from in Babylon? The sins. So question, what if I'm physically out of Babylon, but in my heart, the sins of Babylon are still there? Question, am I freed? Not freed. Publicly speaking, come out of her, my people. Come out of what? That it be not partakers of her sins. So someone says, physically I'm out. I say, amen, we must be out. But spiritually, you must be out as well. Now, so it says here yeah, that the sins of Babylon come out from the sins of Babylon. I want to look at the sins of Babylon. Why must we come out? Look at verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that he be not partakers of her sins. And look at what God says is going to come on Babylon. And that you receive not of her plagues. Question. I want to ask you a question. Where we are living, there's only two op three options you have. I'm saying where we are living in 2023, this very year of June 2023, you only have three options. Option number one is exit, means you die. Some premature death to die. I say premature because, okay, there might be some older, but many of us are younger. In order, I'm saying, where we are, to this announcement of Babylon completely fallen, the crisis, I'm saying where we are standing in 2023, we don't have another 15 years. We don't have another 10 more years in this world left. How, someone says, how do you know? The signs indicate that, both in the church and both in the world, yes. that this is the final generation. Now, I say if we don't die a premature death, option number one is you die a premature death, meaning that you escape, but it's temporary escape because you have to give an account to God. No way, you, you escape temporarily. All it means is you're escaping from choosing a complete surrender to God and receive the seal. Or you continue in the sins of Babylon and receive the unmingled wrath of God. That's the two options left. If you continue to love, friends, I tell you, every one of us here, if we don't die a premature death, every one of us, I don't care who we are, if we don't die a premature death, every one of us are going to perfectly I don't care who we are, we all are going to perfectly reflect either the image of God or the image of Satan. Every one of us, there's no in between. Someone says, no, no, I, I, I'm going to sin and repent. Sin and, mm -mm. We are coming to a time, now it's true, we do make mistakes and fall, but we are coming to a time that where every one of us are going to have to choose a full and complete surrender to Jesus which will lead to a perfect reflection of his image. Or if we reject that by default, inspiration says we're going to be turned into fiends. Prophet says that. That's F-I-E-N-D-S, not F-R-I-E-N-D-S. There's a different, you know, what a, you know there's a friend, and how do you pronounce it? Fiend. Fiend. A friend and a fiend is two different things. Friend is someone that's close to you. Jesus wants us to be his friends. That's what he invites us to, fellowship, friendship. But do you know that if we are not his friends, we're going to become his enemies? We will become his enemies. The Bible says, know we not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. We cannot be the friend of the world and still think I can be the friend of God. Not possible. I must be, if I'm going to be the friend of God, then I become, Jesus says, the world will hate you. 
You will become an enemy to the world. Now, inspiration says, Bible is saying, what I said, you have three options, exit, you die. We are still stand before God. Or two more options left, which I believe many of us stand in this, 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 this group here. Either we're gonna perfectly reflect his image, Jesus' image, or we're gonna perfectly reflect the image of Satan. The entire world, the entire universe is going to get a display of both powers perfectly reflected in humanity. Both the universe is gonna look on. When this crisis breaks is the Sunday law, and friends, we are almost there. We're gonna show you as we conclude, we are on the verge of it, verge of it. Now, I wanna ask one question before I move on. So besides the sins of Babylon, they're the plagues of Babylon. God's gonna pour out his plagues. How many plagues does he pour? Seven. The seven plagues of God. It's called the unmingled wrath of God. Now, those who receive the mark will receive his plagues. I wanna ask you a question. Which of these two are more worst? Which of the two are worst? The <laughs> Sister, brother, <laughs> what I'm gonna say out of the two, which is more worst to me? It's the sins. Say, why do I say that? Friends, if I would say, yeah, the plagues, I would be saying that, let me say it like this, Pharaoh, Pharaoh repented. But his repentance was because of the punishment. Judas repented, but because of the punishment. Esau repented because of a punishment, cried. But that was true repentance. If we repent because of the sins, because we see, what I'm saying, let me say it like this, Pharaoh, Judas, and all of them would have continued doing what they'd done had it not been for the punishment. But when we say it's the sins, then it's different. This is more fearful, why? Because sin breaks the heart of Jesus. If we could choose, if the Lord would give me a choice. Friends, I don't know, but I have spoken to the Lord many times. And I told him, Lord, I prefer death than life. If my life is going to be a failure, my life work will be a failure, I don't want to live. I told God many a times I would rather die. Because to me, life, life has no meaning to me outside of Jesus. If I'm not gonna live and fulfill my life work, then I have no purpose of existence. Therefore, I told God, Lord, please, you'd rather put me to sleep. I'm willing to die any way you choose, but I don't want to live any life if that life is separated from you. If my life work will be a failure, I don't want life. I will choose eternal death if I must, but I don't want life if I cannot fulfill my life work. Now, I want us to see but thank God, we don't have to say, kill me. We can say, Lord, give me the strength. Jesus can help us. Now, friends, I want us to look at this quickly. Let us conclude our study. I want us to see biblically, biblically, what brings Babylon down? What brings Babylon down? Now, true, let me say this, Babylon completely falls. Does anybody know when Babylon completely falls? It says when all nations are drunk of the wine of Babylon. When all nations are drunk of the wine of Babylon. What is the wine of Babylon? Partially, it's its false doctrines. Partially, I said, as its false doctrines. Do you know it's very much possible for you to be drunk? Even now as I'm speaking. It's, you're very much possible you can be drunk. Now someone says, I'm not, I never drink alcohol. I'm not talking about alcohol. Isaiah 29 verse 9 says, they are drunk, but not with wine. They are drunk, but not with strong drink. So it's very much possible you can be drunk and you have never touched a glass of alcohol, but you are, you are drunk. I wonder, I wa someone says, how do I know I'm drunk? I'm drunk. Because we're gonna study and see what brings Babylon down. If that's cherished within the heart, which someone says, but how would I know it's cherished? Well, 
we're going to see what brings Babylon down and what brings Babylon down is manifested through these three ways or these three gods. And if any one of these gods are within your heart, then know that you are drunk. You're not drunk with wine. You're not drunk with strong drink. You are drunk with the intoxicating wine of Babylon. And you know what the prophet says? The prophet says that multitudes would accept the truth had it not been for the wine of Babylon. I want you to see this. Listen to what she says. Before, before we fully, where is it? Listen to this. This is Great Controversy 389. She says, Were it not that the old world, were it not that the world is hopelessly, now, when something's hopelessly, hopeless, is there any hope for it? No. She says, Were not the world, were not, were it not that the world is hopelessly intoxicated with the wine of Babylon? What is the world intoxicated with? Wine of Babylon. Multitudes would be convicted and converted by the plain cutting truths of the word of God. Why are the multitudes not being convicted and converted? They're drunk. Why is it we as present truth, we hear message after message after message that the world's about to end, but we are making no movement? I'm saying physically and spiritually, we're not moving. Spiritually, it seems like we take three steps forward, five steps back. Three steps forward, we testify how God has been good to us, that we've been in such a close, intimate relationship, and three weeks later, we don't want to open up our mouth because we have backslidden further than we were before. Why drunk of what? The wine of Babylon. Do you know that a man can drink alcohol and the next day the man's sober? And then the next day he's drunk and the next day he's sober. And it's, I'm saying in our spiritual lives, it's like one day we are sober and one day we are drunk. Can't hear the voice. You know when a drunk man, you speak to him, sometimes he can't even hear you. Sometimes we're so intoxicated with the wine of Babylon that when God's speaking, we can't hear him. This is our condition in all honesty. Yes, our profession is high as heaven, present truth, third angel's message. But in reality, in all honesty, if we truly search our hearts, we'll see. We would see we are drunk. Not with wine. Mm -mm. Not with strong drink. Mm -mm. We are drunk of the wine of Babylon. And friends, I tell you, if this is our condition as we are nearing the crisis, we're in trouble. There must be a change. And there's a remedy we're going to see. There's a remedy for all this. There's no way God tells you there's a problem, but there's no remedy. Not possible. Whenever God tells you there's a problem, he has a remedy. If you are a true medical missionary, yeah, there are some cases where the person's very bad. But even in that bad state, do you know that? They, they can go to their grave with much pain alleviated. You know that? Medical mission. There's ways that they can, yes, they go into the grave, but they can go with much pain, freed from much pain. Now, I want us to look at this issue of the gods of Babylon. Now, what I want us to do, this was my question I asked, when does this angel come down and announce Babylon has fallen? At what event? All nations are drunk of the wine of Babylon. Sunday. Sunday law. Actually, it's from, it becomes NSL and USL. USL is universal, Sunday law, which is the mark of the beast. That's verse 3. Now, let's see publicly what does God say led to Babylon's fall? What does God say led to Babylon's fall? Come with me in your Bible to Jeremiah, powerful book. I've been studying this book. Jeremiah, come into Jeremiah. Jeremiah wants us to go to chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50. Yeah, we are coming to the conclusion of the matter. All of this was foundation to this point. Jeremiah chapter 50. Are we there? Please tell me, who was Jeremiah speaking to in verse 1? Can you look at verse 1 and tell me, who was he speaking to? Who is he speaking to in verse 1 of Jeremiah 50, verse 1? Babylon, right? It says the word 
that the Lord spoke against Babylon. So the whole chapter is a message of God to Babylon. Now I want you to see, I'm jump down. Jump down in your Bible to verse 31. Jeremiah 50, 31. It says, Behold, I am against thee. So who is God talking to Babylon? Behold, I am against thee, O thou most proud. Say it, the Lord of hosts, for thy day has come, the time that I will visit thee. Verse 32 again. And the most proud shall stumble and fall. Stop right there. What does God say? Why will Babylon stumble and fall? What does he say is the issue? Pride. 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 But biblically, I'm not, someone says, I'm not making a read from the Bible. God says, why literal Babylon stumble and fell? Literally, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, a Belshazzar, exalted himself in his own heart. And let it lead to the fall of Babylon. Literally, God says what led to the literal fall of Babylon was proud, pride. And then he repeats, he says, he repeats in verse 32, he says, the most proud. Friends, it's pride. It is pride. Destin, if it's in the friends, let me tell you, when we are talking about pride, pride is so dangerous. It is so, so dangerous that pride can be full in your heart and it's so deceptive that you can say, I'm not proud. That's pride. And you can be fully convinced, I have no pride. That's the danger of pride. See, pride, you can speak on many sins and you can see it. But with pride, pride, what makes pride so dangerous is that pride does not see its need. That's what inspiration says. Pride does not see its need. Yes, sister. That's, thank you. That's why we're linking the Laodicean church with Babylon. We're not saying the church is Babylon, but we're showing that what causes Babylon's fall is within the hearts of many Laodiceans. Many. Now, I want you to see this. I want you to see this. God does not regard all sins of equal magnitude. There are degrees of guilt in his estimation. Someone says, that's not fair. That's fair. Because, question, if a man steals cheese, not supposed to be eating cheese, but let's say he steals cheese, and there's a man that steal, kills, if, if and that, that you come and you're watching the case, both men, and the judge says, okay, you stole cheese 25 years, you, you killed a man 25 years, is that fair? Punishment according to what? The crime. It says, as well as in that of man. But however trifling this or that wrong act may seem in the eyes of men, no sin is small in the sight of God. So there's no small sin at God. Man's judgment is partial, imperfect, but God estimates all things as they really are. The drunkard is despised and is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven all well and good. Whilst pride, selfishness, and covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these are sins that are especially offensive to God. So friends, when we are talking about sins that are most offensive to God, there they there, pride, selfishness, and covetousness, these sins, she says, too often go unrebuked. And what led to the fall of Babylon? Pride. God hates pride. There are six things which are offensive to God. Here is seven. And one of those things is pride. God hates pride. Why? Pride has caused a great interruption, separation in the universe because of one being who cherished pride. Now, out of these three sins, which one do you think is the greatest? Actually, before I say that, look at the bottom. Pride, red words, pride feels no need and it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. Can you see why we can be in present truth? Very much in present truth, Seventh day Adventists, present truth, but we are not advancing nowhere. Why? Pride shuts the door to Jesus. Why? It feels no need. 
I am rich and increased with goods, Lord. I don't need what you're offering me. I don't need to humble my heart. I don't need to fast and pray. I don't need to, Lord, I am good. I'm okay, go tell someone else. They need you. I'm well and good. I'm in present truth, Lord. I preach at the pulpit, Lord. Lord, I do Bible studies, Lord. Lord, I send texts to people, Lord. You tell him all your good friends, that prayer is a pharisaical prayer. Thanking God how good you are and how sinful they are. Pharisee, pride, pride is dangerous. And friends, if you are measuring yourself with others, you're going to appear good. You will always find someone worse than you. You'll, there's no way you can live it. You'll measure yourself with Christ and you'll tremble. You'll smite your, you'll smite your hand on your breast. You'll say, Lord, have mercy upon me. I'm a great sinner. Pride feels no need. And let me say this before I go on. Lucifer fell because of pride. Do you know another thing? One of the greatest we had within this movement, this man was so great. Listen, dear friends, literally this happened. When he made the institution, they came to him and he said that this institution will now be called a sanitarium. You know what the church said to him, those, men, those people? They said, the word sanitarium doesn't exist. It's not even in a dictionary. He says, watch, this word will soon exist. Do you know, <laughs> the word sanitarium never ever, it was invented by a seven day Adventist that now you can find it in a dictionary. <coughs> the man, God called the man, his calling was so high that when he established what he established, he knew it. He says that the word sanitarium, even though it doesn't appear nowhere, it doesn't exist today, it's gonna appear in a dictionary. Do you know who was that man? Dr. Kellogg. One of the best we had in this movement. Listen to what the prophet says. Listen to what the prophet says. Talking to Kellogg, this has councils on Hell 367. Listen to what she told Kellogg before he went and became a Babylonian. What did she say was his danger? It is a dangerous age. What kind of age? Dangerous. It is a dangerous age for any man who has talents which can be of value in the work of God. Stop right there. Is there some men here who have talent and some women who have talent here? You have talent? You know what she says? It is a dangerous age for any man who has talents which can be of value in the work of God. If you have talent, she says, we are in a dangerous age for you. Dangerous age for me. Someone says, what do you mean if I got talents? Watch it. Satan will take advantage of anything. Anything. He'll either tell you, you only got one talent and try and drive you to unfaithfulness. Or he'll tell you, no one has a talent like you. You're the best. Push you to pride. If he can't discourage you to say, I can't use this talent, they're better talents. He discourages you to bury your talent and be lost, he'll do that. Or he'll whisper in your ear, you're the best in this. There's none like you. And friends, God forbid you cherish those thoughts. God forbid you are striving to be, now, to outdo others. That's dangerous. Very dangerous. She says, it is a dangerous age for any man who has talents which can be of value in the work of God. For Satan is constantly, what is Satan doing to any man who has talents in present truth? For Satan is constantly plying his temptations upon such a person, ever trying to fill him what pride and ambition. What is Satan trying to do? If you have talents, fill you with pride. And when God uses him, listen what, what happens when he's been used by God. And when God would use him, in nine cases out of 10, what percentage? Nine out of 10. That's almost a 90%. She says when God would use him, in nine cases out of 10, he becomes independent, self-sufficient, and he feels capable of standing alone. Whenever somebody is used by God, friends, I'm telling you, be, be very careful against pride. Be very careful. The more God uses you, the more humbly you plead before him. Because if you become puffed up with pride, God knows how to put you aside. I will select someone else. Danger, pride. Pride. Come up in your Bible. I want you to see what God says about pride. 
Come in your Bible to, you know what? Actually, let me do this. Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed with fire. Will God destroy Babylon with plagues? God's gonna destroy Babylon with plagues. What did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with? Fire. If I would ask you, please can you tell me what sin that God see in Babylon that he brought fire? I can almost know, 99% are gonna say homosexuality. I'm sure everyone says homosexuality, right? Publicly coming to Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16. Idleness, okay? Powerful fullness of red. Powerful. Look at the first thing, but. Look at the first thing, Ezekiel 16, 49. Why did God destroy Sodom with fire? Ezekiel 16, 49. It says, behold. Are we all there? 16, 49. Ezekiel 16, verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. What's the first thing that God says there? Pride. 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 Fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her. And in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. What did God say was the great problem of Babylon? Pride. Uh, sorry, of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Pride. It was destroyed with fire because of pride. Friends, I want you to see this. Do you know that Satan has a church today on the earth? Yeah. He has a church. And now, please, as I read this, examine your hearts to ask yourself in, in verity, are you a part of God's church or Satan's church? Listen to what she says. None are too high to fall. None are too high to fall. Sin originated with Satan, who was next to Christ. How high was, how high was, was Lucifer, he was next to Christ. So none are too high, she says, that cannot fall. None are too high that cannot fall. She says, Lucifer, Lucifer became the destroyer of those whom heaven had committed to his guardianship. Satan has a church in our world today. Okay, let's see who's in his church. In his church are all the disaffected ones and the, and the disloyal. All who harbor pride. Question, if you harbor in pride, based on what I've just read, which church do you belong to? The church of Satan. Pride is dangerous. Very dangerous. That's why I'm saying physically you can be in the remnants. But spiritually, based on God, mm -mm. in the church of Satan, in the church of Satan. Now, friends, on this issue of pride, I want us to look at these three gods. One more verse, and then these three gods, and then I stop. Just one verse each. One verse each on these three gods. One verse each on these three gods, which pride can be seen in these three ways. Three gods of Babylon. One more verse on this issue. Come and read your Bible to Malachi, the book of Malachi, Malachi. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi, chapter three, chapter four. Malachi, chapter four. Malachi, chapter four, verse one. Tell me, biblically speaking, how does God define all the wicked? Everyone who's lost, how does God define them? It says, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, question, what does God call everyone who will burn in the oven? Proud, 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 pride. Friends, do you know, let me say this, we know why many of us advance and we stop and we go backwards, because when we advance spiritually, we become proud of this attainment. Like I'm advancing, what about you all? And we become almost proud and then two weeks later, boom, backwards. Friends, whenever, whenever God favors us spiritually, man, you should be humble. The more God is coming close to you, the more humble you should be. And cherish those things. Don't let it puff you up with pride. Okay, I prayed all night, these people, they, are, they ran away, 10 o'clock. 
And then you're praying, but in your heart, I'm, I'm the soldier. These are the weaklings. And then you are praying with pride in your heart. Look how I'm making it. Friends, that's dangerous. Then what you spending your time up because you're so full of pride and woe unto you who are not praying? Because those who meet the crisis based on the Bible, they are praying, pleading and agonizing for victory. Our attitude needs to change. Pride led to the fall of Babylon. Pride. But the pride is revealed in three things. Question, is Babylon fallen? I want to conclude here. One verse on each and then I conclude. Babylon has fallen. Now before we look at, let me show you this. What's inside Babylon? Come with me to Jeremiah 50. Back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is packed. Come with me to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I want us to see Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 38. Jeremiah 50, 38. Jeremiah 50, verse 38. Tell me what does God say is making people in Babylon mad? What is inside Babylon? Verse 1, we were talking about Babylon. Verse 38, listen to what he says is inside Babylon. It says, a drought is upon our waters, and they shall be dried up. Now look at what Babylon is filled with. For it is the land of graven images, and they are mad upon their idols. Question, what is Babylon full of? Idols. And God says these idols are dri driving them mad. Friends, do you know that the more you're going to sin, the more mad? I'm saying literally, it's like you're losing your mind. The more further you go away, go into sin, the more it's as if you're losing your mind, and indeed you are. You are losing your mind to the control of another. That's Satan. Now, Babylon is full of idols. I want us to look at the three idols of Babylon. Or the three gods of Babylon. What are these three gods? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the one is specifically mentioned, I'm keeping for three. It specifically mentions God. One of them. The first two, God shows what leads to the fall of Babylon. Or what he mentions, not so much the fall, but it's also an idol. It's also a god. But God says that this thing, if cherished in your heart, would cause you to fall with Babylon. This second thing will cause you to fall with Babylon. And the third, he says it straight, that this is a false God. Come with me in your Bible. Let's look at the first one. Come with me in your Bible to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. We're going to 1 Timothy. Now, before I read 1 Timothy, Christ's object lessons 161. Christ's object lessons 161. She says we need to shun everything that would encourage, what's that word? Pride. So if something's going to encourage pride, what should I do? Shun it. And self-sufficiency. Therefore, we should beware of giving or receiving flattery or praise. So what we should not receive is flattery. What should we not receive is praise. We shouldn't receive it and we shouldn't do what? We shouldn't give it. It is Satan's work to flatter. Why is Satan trying to flatter? What is he trying to do? Inculcate pride. He deals in flattery as well as in what else? If he's not going to flatter you, what else will he do? Accusing and condemnation. Whenever you see people accusing and you know, man, he's been led by Satan. Thus he seeks to walk the ruin of the souls. Those who give praise to men are used by Satan as his agents. Friends, let us not praise man. Let us never utter a word of praise to a man. No matter whatever good he's been, do not praise the man. When you speak to him, say, praise God. Praise God for speaking through you to my heart. Don't say, oh, you are wonderful, how you are. Mm -mm. Whenever you speak, let God be praised and glorified. Now, mm -mm. another, you know, friends, okay, I can't go through that. I'm going to leave that. But what led to Kellogg's fall, or was pride, that's true. But what the prophet said in that very same page, or the next page, she says that what Kellogg was doing, which caused Satan to walk on him. You know what she says he was doing, which she told him, stop doing it, which was causing Satan to walk on his mind and on his heart. 
You know what Kellogg was doing? That, that, that was causing Satan to have access to him. Look what she says on that. Same about Kellogg just now. She says, your neglected to attend public worship of God is a serious error. What was Kellogg not doing? He was not attending worship. So who do you think was playing on his mind when he was not there? Satan. Satan. She says the privileges of divine service, don't miss divine service, the privileges of divine service will be as beneficial to you as to others and are fully as essential. Fully essential. So Kellogg was not going. He was doing a great work through in the sanitarium, but God told him, you need to go to church. He wasn't going. And this is how Satan got through to him. This is how Satan got through to him. Coming to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. Mm, 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 mm. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6. Are we there? 1 Timothy chapter 6. The gods of Babylon that lead to the fall. What would lead to a fall? 1 Timothy 6. Are we there? I want us to see 1 Timothy 6, verse 9. Look at what would lead to the fall of us when Babylon falls. But they that will be rich, what's that next word? Fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Those that would be rich, what happens to them? They fall. They fall into diverse temptations. Friends, do you know when you seek to be rich, God says, prepare for a fall. Prepare. Someone says, how do you know that pride and, 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 and all these things are linked? Simple. Proverbs 16, 18 says that pride goeth before a fall. So when you see that there's a love of money in your heart, all you know is that's pride, evidence of pride. Love of money. People want to be rich. They love to become rich. Love of money. Pride. Next thing. Come in your Bible to 1 Corinthians. I con I'm giving one verse for each and I close. 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 7 and 8. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 7 and 8. It says, neither let us, or we all, sorry, ne neither, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 10, 7, neither be idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and what's that next word? And fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Question, what leads to a fall? Fornication. Fornication. This is another evidence of pride. Riches and fornication. Seeking to be rich, committing fornication. Bible says that this is an evidence of pride going before a fall. So if fornication is going to cause you to fall, Babylon has fallen. When Babylon falls and you're committing fornication, you fall with Babylon. These are the gods of Babylon, riches, seeking to be rich, fornication, idol of Babylon. These are the idols of Babylon. And God says, I need to rid the heart of these things before the crisis, my child. Because if you are still playing in these things, you are still cherishing these things, when the crisis breaks, I fear for you. And therefore now in this message is knocking. Please let me in. Please let me in. Yes, it's a sacrifice, but please let me in. Please, God's begging, let me in. So I can take away these idols. What's the song? Wash me, make me whiter than so. Break down every idol. Take out every foe. Wash me and make me whiter than snow. Jesus wants to take out these idols from the hearts. These things are making us like Babylon. This is the context of why we are in danger of becoming a daughter, a sister to fallen Babylon because of these things. 
these things. Now the last one. The last one. Coming to Philippians chapter 3. And not a God of Babylon. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. This is a God of Babylon. Philippians 3, verse 21. Actually, did I say 21? I'm so sorry. Verse 18 and 19. 18 and 19, Philippians 3. For many walk of whom I have told you often, now I tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross. Look at verse 19. Look at a God whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Question, give me another God. Diet. Diet. The God of food. The God of food. Friends, these are the gods of Babylon. Simply put, appetite, appetite, appetite. We must control how we eat. Adam and Eve fell over the issue of appetite. Jesus' first temptation was over appetite. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Appetite. We must overcome these gods of Babylon, friends. They must be overcome. We are told in Maranatha, page 62, that the controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands. Had they conquered on this point, she says they would have had the moral strength to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. Those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian characters. Fail, she says. Now, why would they fail? Because appetite is the foundation. Jesus' first temptation, Satan knew if I get you an appetite, I get you everywhere. First temptation, appetite. Adam and Eve, appetite. Satan knows. And friends, we must control. The stomach must not dictate to us. Paul says every man that strives for the mastery, he says is temperate in all things. Even eating out of the good things, you must be temperate. Temperate. And she says nine times out of ten, Many of us, she says, overeat and undereat. There is the danger of over undereating, but she says in nine cases out of ten, she says we overeat. The God, friends, do you know why Satan wants to attack you on appetite? I conclude, yeah, I'm done. Do you know why Satan wants to, and I want to give the remedy quickly. Do you know why Satan wants to attack you on appetite? In the book Temperance, page 13, she says the brain nerves, which communicate to the entire system, as the only medium through which heaven can communicate with man and affect his inmost soul. Question, where does God communicate to your toe when he's speaking to you? Does he communicate to your toe? Does he communi where does he speak to your hand? He speaks to your brain. And the brain speaks to every part of the body. That's why if a man's brain is affected, gets shot in his brain, something else, whole body can collapse and die. She says the brain nerves which communicate to the entire system as the only medium in which heaven can communicate with man and affect his inmost soul. Whatever disturbs the circulation of the electric current of the nervous system, she says, lessens the strength of the vital powers and deadens the sensibilities of the mind. You wonder why you can't make right decisions. Which, which one? Lord, should I work left or work right? Lord, should I do this or should I do that? I'm going to say, examine your diet. You're drunk. Examine your diet and see why can't you discern which way to walk? Why can't you see whether this thing is good or bad in your life? Examine your diet. I conclude. I conclude. Friends, what is the remedy? I'm not giving you a remedy for each. I can give, we're not studying, no time for that. I want to give the remedy for the root of these problems. What is the root of all these problems? This pride. 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 If, if, you, if God gets pride out, you wouldn't be striving for riches. You wouldn't be dreaming to be the richest or trying to get a whole lot of wealth. You wouldn't do that. Because you'll fall. God says you'll fall with Babylon if you are seeking that. Second thing, why fornication? Because of pride. Why the God, your stomach pride? 
Pride. Now I want to conclude. Someone says, then what's the solution for pride? I only have one solution. Only one. There is only one. For me, for you, we both, we all need a help with pride. All of us, we're all in the same boat. We all need help. Someone says, what's the solution? Only one. It's the man Christ Jesus. Amen. It's the man Christ Jesus. So how do I know that? Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, who was a religious leader. Jesus said to Nicodemus, except even though you're teaching the truth, Nicodemus, even though Nicodemus, today you acknowledge as a rabbi, I'm telling you, you need to be born again. Amen. You need to be born again. Many of us in present truth, we need to be born again. Nicodemus heard Jesus say, you need to be born of water and the spirit, and he wondered, how can I have this experience? Jesus said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Do you know what happened in the wilderness when Moses lifted up the serpent? Whoever was bitten by the venom of sin, by the, ven the venom of the serpent, when Moses lifted up that brazen serpent, what happened to those people who looked upon that serpent? They were healed. Jesus says, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up like that serpent, that whoever looks upon the lifted Savior, he says, will be healed. Friends, I'm saying the healing for pride is found in looking at Jesus. All the sins you are struggling with is found in looking at the man Jesus. Look and love. There's a song. There's a life in a look. There's a life in a look. I conclude. No man can of himself understand his errors. No man, you can't, no man can. The lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. You might say, with your lips, Lord, I need help. But the heart is not acknowledging why the heart is full of pride. While speaking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with a conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. In one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. How can we know our true condition? We must behold Christ. We must look, friends. I'm telling you the strength. I know what I'm talking. I've tried that. I know when you look at Jesus, man, you'll weep. You will weep. Life itself is no more desirable. I'm telling you, life does not seem desirable. No, no, I'm not saying you want it. But when you look at Jesus, I'm saying life out of him is no more desirable. I'm telling you, look at Jesus suspended between heaven and earth. Look at the man uplifted upon the cross. See from his hands, his feet, the blood flow mingled down. She says sorrow and love flowed mingled down. Friends, when we look at Jesus, the heart will be drawn like a magnet. Pride and self-esteem cannot flourish in the hearts that keep fresh in memory the sins of Calvary. If you don't want pride in your heart, friends, if you are struggling with any of these things, I'm saying keep fresh in memory Calvary's sins. Spend time reading the life of Jesus. There is found hope, healing, the cure. Now I conclude here. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not doing all that. I conclude here. Yeah. You heard about the Bilderbergs? The Bilderberger meeting just happened a couple of days back. 20th of May, 2023. 20th of May, 2023. It says that at Bilderberg's uh, big week bash, two things are guaranteed, Kissinger and, and secrecy. Now, let me stop here. I would show you what the, do you know what the Bilderbergers, some of us never, build, do you know the Bilderberger is the most powerful group of people that ever meet together and there's top secrecy. I'm telling you, you try and type in Bilderberg on YouTube. On what took place in the current meeting, you'll find nothing. Okay. Try and type Bilderberg on Google on what just took place in the meeting, you'll find nothing. Why? They control the news organization. They control TV. They control YouTube. Top secret. Do you know who found it? Now, my time's up. I will show you what this all means. My time's up. Next week, God willing, I'll explain what took place at the Bilderberg meeting. Who founded it? Kissinger was there. 
It says here Kissinger, Henry Kissinger was there. We'll explain next week. What was the goal at this current meeting? What is the agenda? We look at that next week. I see you have enough. We don't want to overfeed you. <laughs> we'll stop right here. <laughs> Let us kneel. Friends, where's the remedy? Thank you, Jesus. Let us kneel. Let us kneel. Loving Father, we come before you, Lord, realizing our weakness, our failures, our shortcomings. We realize, Father, that the very thing which leads to the fall of Babylon, yea, Father, it's even within our own hearts. There's no denying the fact that pride exists. And if we deny it, it means we are not looking at Jesus. It means we have not fully seen the man of Calvary. Because it's only as we look to Jesus can we get a true picture of what truly is within the heart, in contrast to his holiness. We have seen holy men of God who cried, Woe unto Israel, woe unto Israel, woe unto Israel. But when they came in the presence of divinity, they cried out, Woe is me, for I'm undone. And so, Father, we cry today, not woe was the Seventh day Adventist Church, but woe was us, woe was me. And Father, we are pleading. Yeah, we are helpless. We cannot free ourselves from pride. Just as the disciples on that ship could not save themselves, all their efforts were useless until they realized that the man Christ Jesus was in the ship. And only as they turned to him for help was the storm stilled. And Father, the storm of pride rages within our hearts. We are pleading, Lord, for healing, for, for, for healing from this deadly disease, which is most offensive to you, which is manifested in seeking riches, in fornication, in gluttony, in overeating, in intemperance, in perverted appetite. Father, we are seeking healing. And thank you, Father, that there's a remedy. Yes, there's a remedy. And that remedy is found in Jesus, precious Savior. Father, please, may you do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Please, may you save us, Lord. Save us from sin. Help us to cooperate with you in this work as you seek to uproot the gods of Babylon from our hearts. May we cooperate with you and open up the doors of our hearts that you might cleanse us. We love you, Father. I just want to pause the prayer. You say, Lord, I want to recommit my life to you today. I'm, I have been cherishing these gods of Babylon, but today, Lord, I want to recommit my life to you. And whatever sacrifice you are calling me to make, Father, that today I'm going to make that sacrifice. I'm going to respond to Jesus today, and I'm going to open up the door of my heart, meaning I'm going to surrender wherever he says I must surrender. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Father, you see the hands that are raised. Please, Lord, may you take hold of our weak, frail, fickle hands. And may you please help us to rise above the weakness of the human flesh. Please give us victory where victory is needed. Please draw our hearts closer to you. And please free us, Lord, from these false gods. We love you and we thank you for hearing this prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But all oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the King, and I shall see. Him face to face.